this, you're all going to have some food probably, right? Which means you're, you're sharp, you're ready to, to soak this last bit in, and hopefully your stomachs aren't distracting you too much. So my name is Mike Salins. I'm with Actifio. Anyone here familiar with Actifio or visited our booth so far? A few of you. So Actifio is all about copy data and how you can use copy data to accelerate your DevOps activities, your development, how you can improve quality with development. And the philosophy behind it is very simple. If you look around this room, there are a lot of different vendors with a lot of different products that focus on the development aspect of DevOps. There's also a, a decent number of, of ops, but one of the things there's no shortage of are products that help you manage the life cycle of the code, the promotion, the, the merging, the, you, you got your Chef and Puppet and your Jenkins and all the different tools that are out there, there's, there's no shortage of them. But one thing that seems to be a big glaring hole in the whole process is how do you get quality test data available for the developers early in the development cycle rather than waiting till you've, you've done four iterations with test data or a subset of the data, you bring it over into a staging environment, you run your final test and it blows up. Why? Because your quality of data from testing wasn't where it needed to be. So what Actifio does is it says, while all of your other tools are focusing on bringing your development forwards, we're going to focus on bringing your data backwards. And what I mean by backwards is taking copies of your production data and making them available to the development group many times, immediately, with self-service, without heavy cost, and with security. Now what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of what the Actifio product itself can do. You see I don't even have a, a, a PowerPoint open or anything else. This is just a straight demo and I'll, I'll encourage at the end and I'll leave some spaces for some questions as well. So the concept behind Actifio is very simple. We have role-based access controls. I'm logged in right now with a user and this particular user has very limited access to what he can log into and see. When I log into the product I can see a list of SQL databases. They're all on a single SQL server because that's all I've granted this user access to. He's also got some Oracle databases. Who here is developing with SQL environments? And what about Oracle? Mm, kind of 50-50 and a lot of people that aren't using databases are using something else. Um, I'm going to touch on both of them. I'm actually going to demo both of them if time permits here. And you'll see that the functionality we can provide is pretty equivalent for the two of those. So when this user logs in, they come and they, they select what database they'd like a copy of. They come to a workflow tab where the administrator has predefined what they're able to do. And in this case, this user has one option, run now. When he says run now, he gets a screen that gives him a couple of fundamental choices. He can choose what point in time image from that production source, in this case I have hourly snapshots, which point in time he would like to mount up in his development environment. He can also choose a specific point in time if we're integrating with the database logs, as in this case I am. Then he gets a list of what servers are available to him and which one or ones he'd like to mount onto. In this case, I've pre-selected a SQL server. The other one here is an Oracle server. I've selected a SQL database, so it just makes sense I'm going to mount it onto a SQL server. He scrolls down, and the only real option he needs to focus on here is what would you like to call this new database? So I'm going to call it DevOps, and you can say done, and this is going to kick off a job. Now this job, if I come over to my SQL server, you can see I'm, I'm logged in. I have a set of databases, including in this case Mike's db one which is the source database that I've just chosen. And what the Actifio system is going to do in the background now, and it takes about two minutes to run through, is it's going to take its copy, the point in time that I selected, it's going to take a behind the scenes read-write snapshot of that. That's a thin provision snapshot, so it takes no space initially. It's going to present that as block level storage to this SQL server. You're going to see that because on my Windows Explorer there will be a new drive letter that shows up. I can control where it goes and what mount points and all of that, but just for simplicity's sake I let it take the defaults which is to put a drive so you can all see it easily. After the drive shows up, we're going to actually add that database into SQL Server. And for those of you that are SQL literate, we're going to do this without actually copying the data anywhere. It's going to run directly off of the, the disk that's in the Actifio physical or virtual appliance. It's then going to take the logs and roll them forwards to the point in time that this development user specified and bring that database to an online state. I can see in the background here I've got a disk drive that's showed up. 
if I select on my databases and I hit refresh here, I can see my DevOps database has appeared. It's in restoring mode. That means it's now going to go and start doing the, the log roll forwards for me. While that's going on, let's take a quick look back in my environment at another database. I'm going to go to Oracle, and I'm going to say, I've got the exact same capabilities here. In this case, you can see provisioned virtual Oracle database is the name of a, of a workflow. I've selected it. I can say run now. It's almost the exact same thing as before. Now, in this example, I haven't turned on log monitoring, the archive logs in Oracle. So I don't have the ability to roll to a specific point in time, any point in time with the slider, but I can pick any of the database snapshots that I've captured from the source. I can see the list of servers. In this case, I've selected my Oracle database. It's logical I'm going to mount it to an Oracle server. I have to give it a SID. I'll select DevOps. The rest of the data is pre-populated by the administrator. They can override it if they need to, and you'll notice that the options here are different than they were for SQL Server, which makes sense. Different database, different options. But again, without needing to do anything other than giving it a name, I can go ahead and say next, and it'll begin that process for me. Now, on my Oracle server, I can go ahead and just do a quick take a look at processes, and I can see I have no Oracle processes running. If I look at my disks, I can see I have just some fundamental boot volumes. I have nothing really specific for any database. And like we did for SQL Server, with Oracle, the process is going to start out by saying, here's my copy of the Oracle database in the Actifio appliance, take a read-write snapshot, present it over to that Oracle server, mount up the disk devices. We support both ASM and file system types, so you can have ASM to ASM or file system to file system. And as soon as that disk gets mounted then, as you can now see, there's an additional mount point that's showed up. I can go and take a look at my Oracle processes, and sure enough, here's my DevOps instance. So just like that, I've created an Oracle instance based on my production source. It hasn't consumed any space. It was primarily pre-configured by my administrator. I can come back over to my SQL Server environment and do a quick refresh, and I can see here too, I now have an online database. I have tables. I can do anything with it that I choose. Now, in the Actifio system, when these jobs complete, we can go ahead and I'll flip back over to my SQL database first. And I'll hit a quick refresh over here to refresh the entire page. I can see my job succeeded. I can see it ran almost exactly two minutes. Pretty typical. I can also, however, on the left-hand side, see I have a DevOps database that showed up on my list. Now, just like I went to a production source, I now have another source my development environment. And that development environment, as, divide, as uh, configured by the administrator, it has a policy applied, which means if I go to a restore tab here, it's already kicked off and completed an initial snapshot. The policy that's been applied can run on a schedule. The developer can kick off a job on demand if they want to effectively create bookmarks in their development database. So if they're about to run a test and they know, hey, I'm going to do something that could be destructive here. I better take a bookmark of this state first, because I did some setup work, and I don't want to lose that if I refresh back from production again. Take that bookmark, then go run the test, observe the results. Now, what if that test results in some negative consequence, like, oh, I don't know, the database table was deleted? Really, that wouldn't happen. But maybe the data inside it got corrupted. It didn't go the way you wanted it to. What do you do? Well, you need to roll back to that previous bookmark, right? So all you have to do is select the image. Now, there's only one. Normally, you'd see a list of them over time as they accumulate. Select the image. Come in here. Say restore. I'm going to say restore with recovery, which in SQL terminology means bring the database online. Don't just leave it in a recovering state. I'll say submit. I have to make sure it knows I mean it. So I have to type data loss. And what it means by data loss is it's going to overwrite the existing database that I'm telling it to roll back. Makes sense. You don't want to do that by accident. Now, as this runs, we'll again see the sequence or the progression of activities. If I go ahead and a refresh here, pretty quickly I'll see this DevOps database is going to disappear on me. I can also see in the background there it disappeared. One of my disk volumes disappeared. The one that's left still has the transaction logs. That'll disappear in a few seconds. Then new ones will appear, and it'll bring the database back up to the point in time of the bookmark that I had created. And the exact same thing can happen in Oracle. The interesting thing here is, imagine a, a test scenario where you have um, a QA team. 
and they're running some tests, and they encounter a bug. What happens? Well, you call up the developers and you say, okay, I, I got a problem here. And the developer says, leave that environment. Don't touch it. I got to get into it because I need to see that myself. And the QA guy is sitting there going, I got other tests to run, dude, right? So in this scenario, your QA person can go and say, take a snapshot. Okay, great. Then they can continue their tests. They can roll back if they need to to a previous snapshot and use that. But the snapshots that they take are not only available for rolling back. They can be used to create a new mount into a new environment, to create a new virtual instance from that point in time state where the issue existed. So no longer do the developers have to block the testing efforts in order for them to troubleshoot, resolve, and inspect those problems. Take a quick look back over here at Oracle. One thing I did want to highlight is if I go ahead and just look, you can see the file system that was mounted there. If I, if I take a... Um, Let's see. I'm going to set my environment. SQL plus. In this database, one thing I wanted to highlight, you could see in the Windows environment that that disk had appeared. And I could go and show you that it was running off the disk. Here, too, in the Oracle environment, I see I have a DevOps instance. If I scroll up to the top of my little test script here, you can see where all of the data files reside. So this is all on that disk that didn't exist just a handful of minutes ago. Come back into, uh, I want to show you the administrator interface. Unfortunately, it's taking just a moment on the, uh, on the rollback there. There's a minor bug in the GUI. This is, by the way, a, a, a development release. I haven't yet upgraded to the GA release. The, the feature, some of the features I'm showing you were just released literally in the last week. My test environment hasn't been upgraded yet. Sorry about that. So I can see that job is now completed. I can come back over to my SQL server. I can do a quick refresh here. I can see my DevOps database is back. I can expand out. I can see the table that I deleted is back exactly as you would expect and with a minimum number of clicks, minimum complexity, pretty simple to do. Now, with all of that simplicity comes a lot of power. I'm now going to switch over to the administrator interface because the administrative interface has a lot of functionality. You can narrow down what users can do and what they can see, but you can also have the abilities to do almost anything that you like. So here, just, just by way of what they see, you can see instead of just a couple of Oracle databases, I can now see 14. And from a SQL Server standpoint, I've got 137 throughout this environment that I have access to. When I take a look at my workflow, in this case the Oracle workflow, I have more options including edit and you can see some of the choices that the administrator can make that weren't available to the user. Things like if I'm mounting into a virtual machine, what type of back-end disk mounts should I use? What should my mount points be if I want to specify them instead of letting them be dynamically generated? Do I want scripts to run before and or after these mounts? I got a, a question in a session this morning from somebody saying, hey, how do you handle schema changes? When you refresh back from production, what happens to the schema changes that I made in my dev environment? And you know, the answer to that is the refreshes that we do are refreshing the entire database container. And so those schema changes get rolled back. That's why we have the ability to do things like run scripts before and after refreshes, mounts, unmounts, creations, etc. And those processes can be they can run anything that you like. A common use case would be exactly as you described, a schema update. So either you have a, a script that makes your schema changes that automatically gets called after every refresh, or perhaps you have some data in the database. You're, you're developing using stored procedures, and you'd like to save those from refresh to refresh. So you have a simple script that exports them out. You let the refresh, uh, as a pre-script, you let the refresh happen, and then you go ahead and you re-import them at the end of the refresh. Now I've shown you provisioning of a new instance. I've shown you bookmarking, giving you a, a sample for that. I haven't shown you the actual refresh process. And the refresh process is almost identical to what we've done before. So if I take a look at my user interface here, and I'll do this one on the Oracle environment, for example. Come over to my DevOps database, which uh, actually I go to my source database. Sorry about that. I'll come over to my workflow. And I'll do that very same run now. And your first instinct is, wait a minute, run now is how you created the new instance, right? I didn't highlight it, but within the run now, there's an option down here called refresh existing. And when you do that, 
you get a list of all of your existing test instances that you've created on previous occasions. So between saying refresh now, picking an instance, and selecting a different point in time, in this case I'll pick the most recent one, last time I picked the middle of the three, and saying done, that kicks off the refresh job. And just like that, it will go ahead and take down my Oracle instance, take away those disks, present the new disks from the correct point in time, reinstantiate my Oracle instance. Now, we got off to a little bit of a late start, so I rushed through this a little bit. We are now right at the end of when this session is supposed to be, but I do want to give people an opportunity for just a few questions. But before I do that, and I'll say this now and I'll say it at the very end as well, Booth 219 will be there for a while. So if you want to have a more in-depth discussion, do what-if scenarios on specifics, please come on by and visit us. Any questions for here? Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, what if there's a group of databases and I want to do things to them together? So in that scenario, you can do things like, say, I'll filter here, um, SQL 7. In my administrator view, I can define groups of databases. So maybe I want to come in here and say, um, these two databases, I'm going to group them together into a consistency group. And then the consistency group gets created. I, I give it a name. Uh, do that. Now, this consistency group acts just the same as any single database. I can apply policy to the entire group. I can go ahead and sorry, refresh. I can go ahead and apply policy. I can create workflows to predefine what my users are going to do. I can um, do what we call application aware mounts, which is where you create a database from it. When you have a consistency group and you instantiate your databases, you have the option of saying, for the database names, assign a prefix. So maybe QA1 underscore and then the database names that they were the originals, or QA2. So you can even have them coexist on the same target service if you like. So the question was, uh, do we support other databases besides Oracle and SQL Server? And the answer is yes, in varying degrees of integration. We have the ability to effectively capture data from production sources for almost any type of database if you can quiesce it to a consistent state. We have integration that leverages VMware change block tracking, some agent-based change block tracking, some SAN-based change block tracking. Different deployment scenarios are used based on what your environment looks like. We don't have the same level of bringing a database online for every type of database yet. We've just added that particular feature and we started out with Oracle and SQL being the two most popular. You can guarantee that over time we'll be adding additionals like DB2 and Sybase and, and so, so on and so forth, you know, Postgres, et cetera. So the question is, do we have the ability for a data-only restore from production rather than a full database restore from production? We don't at this time, but, um, and, and you mentioned the reason why, you know, sometimes doing those schema changes and whatnot can be tricky. That's kind of the beauty of automating the process, is they're tricky when you have to do them manually, and when you're doing it infrequently, you typically end up doing it manually. When you have the ability to one-click and do it, you tend to get the automated process down fairly well. One other thing I didn't mention is we have the ability to create actual full copies and then do uh, integration with data masking utilities. So there's actually some of those companies in the room as well. And enforce from a security standpoint that developers can only see data once it's been masked. That's particularly important in a lot of the financial sectors, uh, healthcare, where you got HIPAA, et cetera. Other questions? Booth 219, please come by and visit us. We'd be happy to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with you.